Sure, I can do that. So thank you. Um, so so historically, this undergraduate uh, student research competition, um, it's been going on for a few years now. Um, the first, I think, the first one, maybe the only one. Uh, that was attached to the Brain Tumor uh, Foundation of Canada Info Day. Um, um, but the Info Days transitioned into sort of a webinar series. And, and then the COVID situation came about. So the last few competitions have been virtual and that seems to be working fine. Um, I think the students and others should know that the um, Del Mastro family um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Roly Del Maestro and Pam Del Maestro um, were one, were two of the three founders of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada many, many years ago. Um, Dr. Del Maestro is a neurosurgeon and uh, his wife, Pam, uh, was a neuroscience nurse and, and they founded uh, with Steve Northey, the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. But a few years ago, uh, Dr. Del Maestro and his family um, chose to sponsor or, or support, I guess is a better word, um, the student competition. So they provided funding and the uh, seed funding that they provided um, provides the prize money uh, for the students in this competition. Um, traditionally, the presentations projects are inspired by case scenarios, um, which myself and others, uh, Adriana and others have helped to put together. Um, in the past, we've had cases um, of patients who have high-grade glioma, low-grade glioma. We've had a pediatric case of a nine-tumor case. Um, but to my knowledge, we yet to have a, a case of a patient with um, brain metastasis from the lung. And as you can see, the last uh, uh, presentation highlights the fact that um, you know cancer can occur in various parts of the body, um, and and we need to solve the problem of of cancer that. That, uh, that goes to the brain. Um, the, the case that we had um, this year was a patient, fictitious patient, Wilhelm, who was 56 years old. Um, he developed progressive uh, right-sided uh, weakness and uh, seizure activity um, was seen in the emergency department and neuroimaging uh, revealed a chest lesion in the right upper lobe of his lung, as well as um, two brain lesions and the students were provided with the imaging showing the two brain lesions. Um, as part of the scenario, uh, Wilhelm and his family met with the uh, neurosurgeon and uh, underwent resection of these two lesions and then went on to meet with the neuro-oncology team, radiation oncologist, medical oncologists, uh, and so forth. Um, so the, the questions we asked of the students um, were were variable. I mean, it's up to the students as to what they want to do. But um, you know, we we gave them suggestions around things like um, uh, targeted therapies, um, which which um, are more becoming more common in brain metastasis, um, as well as um, radiation treatment um, uh, and, and so forth. Um, we also gave them the option of discussing quality of life issues. That the students had to send us a letter of intent, which outlined the project. Um, and, and we you know, partly um, saw how the um, case scenario inspired their response. So they sent us this letter of intent. And then now the second part is to give us a presentation. Um, myself, Adam and Adriana will be the judges. And then um, they give the presentation and the three of us have, have the ability to ask them questions. And then after the three presentations, uh, the three of us will sit down and figure out which one we thought was, um, well, rank them in order of merit, I guess. So so that's the process. Uh, back to you, Sue. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, so yes, in regards to merit, the first place um, team will win $1,000, the second place $750, and the third place $500. Um, and ranking um, and, and um, asking the questions of you today, are Dr. Adriana Ranger, who is a pediatric neurosurgeon, um, Dr. Joseph Megacy, who is a neurosurgeon, uh, both at uh, London Health Science Center, and uh, Dr. Uh, Adam Wutster, who is a resident physician in radiation oncology with the London Regional Cancer Program. So thank you so much to the judges for um, being here today and, and helping out with this, uh, the portion of the, of the, um, of the program. 
so Ben, uh, I have you um, all set, ready to go as a co-host if you wish to bring up the slides uh, for your group. And the first group who will be presenting is team one uh, from McMaster. So uh, once your slides are up, Ben, um, then we can, um, I will hit start on the timer. Sure, thank you, just give me one second. Could you guys hear the, the little jingle when it went off? Okay, perfect. Yep. Yep, I think they're good. All right. Okay, all set. All right, well, the floor started. is yours. Okay. So hello everyone, we hope you're all doing well. My name is Ikra and I'm joined with my colleagues, Benjamin and Daniel, and we are undergraduate students from Dr. Sheila Singh's Brain Cancer Lab at McMaster University. And today we'll be introducing you to our project, which is to identify molecular drivers involved in lung to brain metastases. So we'll just quickly summarize our case study. So our patient Wilhelm had an MRI and CT scan, which revealed two brain lesions and a mass in the right lung. Surgical resection of the brain lesions was performed and the tumor samples were sent off for pathological analysis. And it was determined that the lesions were the result of lung to brain metastasis. So what is lung to brain metastasis? It's when cells from the lung tumor spread to the brain to initiate a secondary tumor. And this is accomplished through a process called the metastatic cascade, which can cause selection-driven differences in the secondary tumor. And of those cells that are able to metastasize, only a rare fraction can initiate the brain tumor. And these cells are said to possess stem-like properties, which allow them to resist conventional therapy. And so by understanding differences between cellular populations of the metastatic cascade, we can identify molecular drivers and functional dependencies of lung to brain metastasis, and we can then further target these to eliminate disease. So for our project, we will examine changes in gene expression and characterize the functional genomic landscape of matched primary lung tumors and the metastatic brain tumors as described in AIMS 1 and 2. Together, these two aims will then identify the genes that are involved in the metastatic cascade and initiation of the brain tumor. And then for our final aim, we will then validate those gene targets that we've identified as drivers of brain metastasis and metastatic tumor formation. So the very first step is to make use of the patient lung primary uh, and brain metastasized tumors. So in addition to the brain tumor, which has already been removed, we will perform surgical resection to take a sample of the patient's lung tumor. And both the lung and the brain tumors will be dissociated and then cultured in conditions that are enriching for stem cells uh, separately. And this will allow us to study the cells that may be involved in tumor initiation. So for our first aim, we want to identify genes differentially expressed between the primary lung tumor and the metastasized brain tumor. And so we'll do this using RNA sequencing. And so we'll just extract RNA and prepare a complementary DNA library. Uh, which will be outsourced for the actual RNA sequencing. And so here sequences will be aligned to a reference genome and expression will be quantified. And we can further deduce uh, pathway level differences using gene set enrichment analysis to see pathways that are uh, expressed. And so here genes differentially expressed poses potential drivers of the metastatic cascade or of the formation of the brain tumor itself. For second game, we want to determine differences that may exist in the functional genomic landscapes between the primary and metastasized uh, brain tumor cells. And so we'll do this using a genome-wide CRISPR knockout screen, where both the primary and metastatic tumor cells will be infected uh, with this lentiviral guide RNA library. And so this library targets each gene in the genome uh, individually for knockout. And so we'll culture these infected cells through many doubling times. Uh, and afterwards, the guide RNA will be extracted, sequenced, and quantified at the beginning and end of the screen. Uh, and the guides that are depleted uh, will indicate genes essential for the fitness of our tumor cells. And so additionally, a pathway level functional enrichment analysis can be used to determine uh, pathways that are essential in both the brain tumor and lung tumor. And here, the overall uh, goal is to determine genes essential in the metastatic tumor, uh, which may be drivers of tumor formation and poses direct therapeutic targets. So lastly, for our third aim, we want to take genes uh, from AIM-1 uh, that, again, were upregulated to promote the metastatic cascade or formation of the brain tumor uh, and cross-reference these with uh, the CRISPR screen hits from AIM-2 uh, to narrow down potential drivers of brain metastasis. 
Um, and so here we'll assess stem-like properties and the ability to promote brain metastasis uh, functionally. And we'll validate these in our top 10 hits by transducing both the primary and the metastatic tumor cells with a CRISPR knockout vector targeting these respective genes. And so we'll uh, use assays to determine changes in proliferation, sphere formation, migration, and uh, metastatic tumor formation. All right, so going off of what Ben said about the assays, we're first going to start off with a proliferation assay, and this um, assesses the effects of the gene knockouts on cellular growth. Both lung and brain tumors will be dissociated, plated in a 96-well dish, and expanded. A, de a detection dye will then be added to each well um, to determine cell proliferation. This is very um, important in cancer because we're, our whole goal is to lower cell proliferation and try to um, basically kill off the tumors. So then following this proliferation assay, uh, we'll do a limited dilution assay, and this will determine the effect of the gene knockouts on cell renewal and steadiness of these cells. To do this, increasing densities of cells will be plated and allowed to grow before quantifying the amount of uh, spheres formed in wild type and knockout cells. And once again, to reiterate, the importance of this assay is to determine the stemness of the cancer stem cells um, in the tumors. Um, following this, um, uh, migration assay will be conducted to determine the migrational ability of the cancer cells. This is very important when we talk about metastasis because we're trying to understand how the cells are migrating throughout the, throughout the body and how it gets to the brain. So in this procedure, we place an agar mold in the, in the middle of a petri dish and we plate cells around this mold. And after the, the agar mold is adhered, we take it off and we see how um, the cells move into the empty space left behind. And over the next three days, we image this empty space to see how far the cells have migrated. So following all of these um, in vitro studies, we then move on and translate them into in vivo work through um, xenografting um, our, our cells into the lungs and brains of immunocompromised mice. And we allow the tumors to grow. Um, with this, we'll then assess the prevalence of brain metastasis using immunohistochemistry and we'll compare the survival between NACO and wild type engrafted mice. This allows us to see the in vivo effects that the knockout has on the metastasis ability of the cells from the primary to the primary site to the brain. So after these studies, um, we just wanna talk about the rationale of the research. So in conclusion, if we're able to identify genomic and transcriptomic differences between the primary and secondary tumors, we could uncover targets in lung to brain metastasis with the overarching goal of blocking this process through targeted therapies. So we would like to thank Dr. Sheila Singh, Dr. Chitra Venugopal, and our entire lab team for their continuous support. Without them, this presentation would not have been possible. We would also like to thank the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada for giving us an opportunity to share our project. Thank you for listening to our presentation. We will now take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. I will now open the floor up to uh, Dr. Ranger, uh, uh, Joe and Adam, please to uh, answer or ask any questions that you might have. Let's see, hi there, uh, it's Adriana here. Uh, so for, first of all, I just wanna congratulate you uh, Benjamin Daniel Acroft for making such a great presentation and also describing a very well thought out and an elegant research idea. Um, you know, this, this kind of gets back to that, oh, you hear my dog barking in the background, I'm really sorry. Um, you know, back to uh, Stefan Paget in the late 1800s, he kind of described the seed and soil hypothesis of, of metastasis. And it seems to me your project is trying to get at the the seed aspect of it and characterize the, the cells that are actually moving, not the micro environment they land in, but the cells themselves. And so I'm wondering for these brain metastasis uh, cells, uh, brain metastasis initiating cells, are these putative or are, is this an actual definable population? So that's, that's one question that I had. And the other question was, what do you think about comparing the genomes of cancers that don't spread 
because lung cancers do, but there are certain populations of primary tumors that don't spread. And I wonder if there would be an opportunity to find drivers of metastasis by exploring that side of it. Yeah, sure. So I guess I'll start. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, for the first point, uh, I personally study GBM, um, but I know our lab has definitely established a lot of information about these uh, initiating cells um, that initially seed in the tumor. Uh, we initially started this project looking at those cells that seed, um, which uh, there's kind of uh, two different populations. One we describe as the cells that originally seed, and then one that kind of occurs uh, when the tumor is actually detectable and forms. Um, and so we've characterized these cells quite well, actually. The only issue is that um, really logistically, it's hard to actually extract and study these cells for the assays we did. Um, and so, oh, sorry. Is that an alarm that just went off? Okay, I'm good. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, and sorry, for the uh, second question, could you just repeat the question? Oh, yeah, I was just wondering, um, so you're making a comparison in, in your project between the primary and the genome of the primary through the, the uh, CRISPR process versus the, the MET and trying to identify drivers of metastasis that way. And I wonder if, if you can also look at tumors that don't actually metastasize, if, uh, if you would find differences in their genome, or maybe that's already been done. Um, actually, I could help answer this one. So I think you're right. I think if we had an experiment where we took um, patients that had lung tumors that metastasized to the brain, and then we also had patients just with lung tumors that we know don't metastasize. And we do like RNA sequencing on all the cell populations. And then we do like CRISPR to see how the cells are affected. We would definitely see, I think we would see a difference in the RNA sequencing between the tumor, lung tumors that go to the brain and then the lung tumors that don't. And I think the answer, the reason why this is the answer is because um, cancer cells or the tumor cells, they have to go through um, different gradients as they move through the me metastatic cascade with like EMT and MET. So there definitely be different expressions of gene levels to initiate that process for sure. And then I guess through that, you could probably find, you could probably find a therapeutic target. However, I, I'm pretty sure like most patients, when they come into the clinic, um, they already have brain meth. So it's kind of hard to like find a patient that has lung cancer and be like, okay, let's use this there. They're like therapeutic because we think you're at a higher risk of brain metastasis. And sorry, if I could just actually add on to that as well. Um, if we took patients that uh, don't have a, a, meta a metastasized tumor, um, we could also help use that population and compare the RNA-seq data to the ones we already have of the metastasized patients. Um, which would be another helpful tool using that kind of uh, patient population where we could actually maybe predict, um, once again, it's a big project doing that, but kind of predict maybe a prognostic gene signature of, uh, to stratify patients of who have a higher risk of metastasis occurring. How are we for time, Sue? Do we have time for another question? Uh, yeah, we can do another one. Okay, uh, excellent uh, slides team. That was uh, very well presented. I saw that um, it looked like you were going to xenograft, uh, xenograft knockout lung tumors into the lung and knockout brain tumors back into the brain. Uh, I think that's an interesting approach. I'm wondering in terms of targets, what you would, whether you would be targeting tumors that had not yet metastasized in hopes of preventing metastasis or to target metastasized tumors with hopes of presenting further or preventing further metastasis? I'm just a little fuzzy on that, that rationale. The same question too, Adam. Sure. So uh, I think the two uh, kind of assays we, or our two aims, aim one and two, uh, kind of propose different types of targets that we could find. So the CRISPR screen mainly would actually show us genes essential in the uh, tumor that's already formed um, or essential in the formation of the tumor, but 
really what we can do with these targets, uh, the main thing is that they're direct therapeutic targets. And so I think we could prevent uh, further tumor growth and eventually uh, formation of the brain tumor uh, in the brain environment. Um, the RNA-seq data is a little bit more complicated in what it's indicating. And so we'd have to look uh, through further assays to see what it's really telling us. Um, I think those two main types of fits you can get from that screen is uh, first genes essential to actually uh, let the cells metastasize. So whether it's involved in that cascade, um, but then the second type could also be, uh, you could imagine we could see genes that are essential again in the formation of the brain tumor once the cells seed. Um, and so that would be uh, more indicative of stem cell properties. Um, so it's kind of a different approach we take to each kind of hit we get. It would be more individualized to each gene. Um, but I think the main goal is to target uh, kind of both aspects depending on the hit. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you so much to Daniel, Ben, and Ikra for your uh, time and your presentation. That was wonderful. Um, and thank you to the judges for uh, the questions that you had. Um, we will now move forward on to team two, who is our team from Western. Um, and uh, Meta, you have the, um, the co-host option right now, so you can uh, start to share when you're ready. Perfect, thank you. All right, so good morning. Oh, sorry? Nope, go ahead. All right, sounds good. Uh, good morning, my name is Maida. And my name is Chesta. And we are both thrilled to be presenting our proposal of the use of manos and liposomal grafted POPC liposomes in the delivery of bevacizumab to Wilhelm's secondary brain tumor. Uh, we would like to take a moment to extend our deepest gratitude towards the Del Maestro family for establishing this competition and providing us with this wonderful opportunity. So one of the biggest optical obstacles in the delivery of anti-cancer drugs is the penetration of the blood-brain barrier. Due to the highly selective nature of the barrier, a method of drug delivery capable of effectively crossing this barrier has not yet been accomplished. VEGF is a pivotal protein in the angiogenesis of tumor cells. It's upregulated by oncogene expression and is therefore a common target of many anti-tumoral drugs. One such notable drug is bevacizumab, which has been deemed an incredibly promising treatment for cancer, specifically brain tumors metastasized from the lung. Bevacizumab, which we will now refer to as BBZ, is one of the many drugs that have also faced the challenge of crossing the blood-brain barrier. A common area of exploration is the use of liposomes encasing the drug as a drug delivery system. Studies employing POPC, or phosphatidylcholine liposomes, have been used to target mouse embryonic fibroblasts in the delivery of antitumoral agents. A mechanism that can manipulate the barrier must be employed by disguising foreign particles as molecules for which receptors already exist on the blood-brain barrier. As such, the use of sugar grafting was an area of interest to us. Prior research has indicated that the sugar mannose is particularly effective in this regard. So in summary, there is currently a lack of an effective drug delivery mechanism through which BVC and various other antitumoral agents can be administered, hindering the performance of many VEGF inhibitors. Manos-coated POPC liposomes grafted using delivery-enhancing lipopeptides will allow BVZ to better penetrate the blood-brain barrier and more precisely target tumor cells, thereby improving the responses of brain tumor patients prescribed this drug. As a result of the incorporation of calcine in the liposomes, there would be increased fluorescence in the tumorous areas. So there are three main aims which we hope to address through our proposal. Our first aim is to successfully penetrate the blood-brain barrier uh, by mannose grafting the drug encapsulating vesicles. So the blood-brain barrier is capable of recognizing sugar molecules, especially since there already exist mannose receptors on the barrier. And so the mannose coating will be used to disguise BBC as a mannose particle. The second aim is to target the tumor metastases precisely to avoid harming surrounding cells. And this will be uh, accomplished through the use of TBFGF peptide, which is a truncated basic fibroblast growth factor, which binds to fibroblast growth factor receptors prominent in cell cancers. These FGFRs are often used as target molecules due to their angiogenic properties that promote rapid cell growth. 
And then finally, the third aim is to trigger the appropriate release of the drug when in proximity of the metastases. The galapeptide is a pH sensitive peptide originating from hemagglutinin in influenza, which is responsible for binding the virus to cell surface receptors and mediating the liberation of the viral genome into the cytoplasm through membrane fusion. Gala will act in a very similar way as, as it is triggered by the acidic surroundings of the metastases, resulting in the endosomal escape of the enclosed drug into the cytosol of the tumor cell. Prior to synthesizing the liposomal casing, the lipopeptides that are to be incorporated alongside the phospholipids of the POPC liposome must be synthesized. This is accomplished using a reaction known as the pyridyl disulfide reaction. This entails a thiol group of DPTE being activated and reacted with the cysteine residue of TBFGF and GALA through two pyridyl disulfide exchange reactions. The first reaction, as you can see on the left side of your screen, consists of lipid activation and the second, lipid bioconjugation. These two reactions are performed for both of the peptides to form the lipopeptides. Next, the formation of POPC vesicles grafted with surface lipopeptides entails the use of a method known as thin film hydration followed by extrusion. So the synthesized lipopeptides will also be added to the lipid solution as they're part of the liposomal exterior of the POPC vesicle. And then the hydration will consist of an aqueous solution containing BBZ, calcine, uh, as well as phosphate buffered saline being added to the dry lipid film. And then the solution will be vortex, sonicated and extruded. Finally, mannose grafting will be performed to allow the drug to pass through the blood-brain barrier. The procedure entails a covalent coupling of P-aminophenol glycosides to POPC liposomes. A POPC liposomal suspension must then be combined in a sodium phosphate buffer containing sodium chloride. This solution must then be fixed with P-aminophenol AD manicide, and glutaraldehyde would then be added slowly to the liposome suspension, and the mixture must then be incubated. Um, so there are different aspects of the, this drug delivery system that must be tested prior to administrating this drug to humans. First, a tissue culture in the form of a cancer cell line from a person who has metastases in the brain from lung cancer will be taken. As opposed to traditional cell lines, primary cell lines are isolated directly from human tissues, and that's why they have a finite lifespan. However, they are more relevant and reflective of the in vivo environment. So a control group will consist of a cancer cell line that is treated with fluorescence tagged bevacizumab, while the experimental group will be treated with the synthesized liposomes and closing bevacizumab. The results of each of the groups will be compared in order to evaluate whether the DPTE gala was able to trigger the appropriate release of the drug. The mice that will be used to test the efficacy of the proposed experiment are the BALB slash C mice. A mice model would be effective in this case as the blood-brain barrier of mice comprises endothelial cells as well as mannose receptors and has already been an agent of experimentation in studies researching the permeability of the barrier. To create an accurate mouse model of the tumor in question, immunodeficient mice are to be transplanted with xenografted glioblastomas, which would be representative of Wilhelm's case. This stage serves to assess the effectiveness of mannose grafting and DPT-ETB-FGF components of the liposomal structure. The control mice group will be administered fluorescence tagged bevacizumab intravenously, while the treatment group will be administered the liposomal delivery of the method of bevacizumab. Finally, the drug will be administered to humans alongside chemotherapy. The experimental and control groups will be identical to the mouse phase, except in this case, the experimental units would be humans as opposed to mice. So just to summarize the drug delivery mechanism, first, the POPC liposomes would be injected intravenously into the individual. Next, upon traveling through the vasculature of the body, they will arrive at the blood-brain barrier. The mannose would be recognized by mannose receptors on the barrier and would therefore be able to pass through. Next, the TBFGF lipopeptide will bind to the overexpressed FGF receptors. Then the gala lipopeptides will change conformation into an alpha helix, compromising the structure of the membrane as a whole and allowing the contents of the liposome to be released into the cytosol of the tumor cell. And finally, using pre-existing mechanisms, BBC will now inhibit angiogenesis. We expect there to be a greater level of fluorescence surrounding the tumor masses specifically. Through confocal fluorescence microscopy, we can assess the bioavailability of the drug around the tumor. We are hoping that the experimental group biopsies will show a reduced rate of growth of the tumor's masses and a reduced rate of angiogenesis. So to analyze our data, the first analytical test is a t-test for difference in means in which the increase in area of the tumor for the treatment group is predicted to be lower than that of the control as indicated by the alternative hypothesis. And then the second test will be a large sample procedure for difference in proportions indicating whether the proposed drug delivery method is more efficient in precisely delivering the drug to the tumor's masses. 
The carrier proposed is a liposome grafted using sugars and lipopeptides that allow effective recognition by the blood-brain barrier and active targeting of the tumor cells. The proposed experiment is feasible because much of the equipment and tools required are available here at Western University, and the drug is highly metabolizable by humans. Thank you, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Sorry, I said incredible timing. <laughs> I don't know if you guys uh, you probably didn't hear because it was on mute, but as soon as you said thank you, the, the timer <laughs> went off. So thank you so much for uh, that great presentation. Uh, I will now open the floor up uh, to the judges to ask any questions in which they may have. So, so I, I enjoyed your presentation. Um, it, it seemed to me that the main um, thrust of your presentation was the development of a drug delivery system. Um, how specific is your drug delivery system um, for the delivery of bevacizumab? Um, I guess my question is, could your drug delivery system be adapted to deliver other um, drugs that have trouble crossing the blood-brain barrier? Because as you pointed out in your introduction, that's been one of the main difficulties in treating patients with, uh, with a brain tumor. Um, there are some uh, drugs that are effective in a Petri dish, but you can't get them into the brain tumor, um, partly because of the blood brain barrier. So could your, could your system be adapted for other, uh, other drugs other than an anti-angiogenic agent like bevacizumab? Uh, yeah, definitely. So that's a, oops, sorry. That's a great question. And um, yeah, that definitely would be the case. Due to the fact that we're employing thin film hydration in which the drug is only incorporated in the aqueous stage, any drug really can be incorporated and the lipopeptides that are incorporated, which would be the DPTE TBFGF lipopeptide, allows the accurate targeting of the tumor cells. And then the GALA allows the effective um, uh, release of the drug at the appropriate time. So um, any drug can be incorporated as long as that change is applied to the thin film hydration stage. And um, just as a note, like this method can also be used to various areas of the body, not just the brain. Um, it's not just exclusive to that, but uh, in order to allow this to be applied to various areas of the body as well, the stage of manoscrapping wouldn't be as essential because the entire purpose of manoscrapping was just for it to be recognized by the, by the blood brain barrier. So um, if that were to be excluded, then this could be applied to nearly any tumor around the body, as well as using any drug. Thank you. Of course. Oh, yes, Joe, you know that I had the same question as you. I, um, I, That's I, why I asked it quickly so I could get it in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I, I, I really want to congratulate you, um, Chesna and Meta, uh, for your very clever idea for drug delivery. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And I think you've given us a really very clear description of your proposal and your methodology, especially for someone like me. Uh, whose chemistry is pretty dusty or, you know, rusty. Um, I guess I wonder, because your, your vehicle is a mannose-coated um, compound, would there be any adverse effects associated with your liposome? I mean, can mannose be taken up in other organs? Could you end up with, um, you know, sort of a bystander, an innocent bystander effect um, is, is this really very specific to the brain and the blood-brain barrier, or would we have to look at other toxicities as a consideration? Um, yeah, so thank you. I understand your question. Thank you. Um, so because of there being many mannose receptors around the body, yes, this drug can be, the uptake of this drug can be in other parts of the body. But Due to the lipopeptides, which is the TBFGF, as well as the GALA lip uh, lipopeptides, we believe that even if this uh, mannose coated liposome was up uptaken by different parts of the body, it would not be able to release the drug because, you know, regular parts of the body don't express, for example, the FGFRs as much as the cancerous growths do, as well as cancerous growths also have uh, a slightly more acidic environment. And that's what triggers our liposome to actually break down because, um, so it's very, GALA is very actually similar to hemagglutinin on the influenza virus. So it changes the shape uh, when it's in an acidic environment and it causes it to break down. And 
there are acidic other in, acidic environments in the body, but that's why the mannose receptors come into play first, and then once they're uptaken, and that's when the lipo uh, lipopeptides will come into play. And you know, uh, that's sort of like our uh, safety precaution or like a seatbelt, I guess you can say, uh, for making sure that the bevacizumab doesn't have any other toxicity effects on other parts of the body. Um, but I do think one area that we would have to, you know, be really careful about and monitor closely is the use of our calcine, which is basically a, like a fluorescence tag. We're fluorescence tagging them just so that it, it would be easier to, you know, monitor the uh, progression of the drug in the body. And so calcine, we are aware that has toxicity effects, but again, that would be very closely monitored. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you for clarifying that. That's great. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much, ladies. Um, I have um, given uh, Sabrina the access as a co-host as well. Uh, our third team is from McGill. Okay, so hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining us and giving us the opportunity to present our research proposal. So I'm Sabrina, and I'm here with my colleagues Leonais and Justine to present our research proposal on a new palliative care tool that will help improve the quality of life of uh, brain tumor patients and their immediate family members before and after dying. So research has demonstrated that a brain tumor diagnosis negatively impacts the quality of life, not only of the person diagnosed with cancer, but also their close relatives. One way that we can help improve their quality of life is through advanced care planning. Advanced care planning is a process that enables patients to make decisions while they're still able to regarding the future health care that they would like to receive and how they want their end of life to look like. Advanced care planning has been shown to improve quality of life and it also assists the grief process in patients and their family members. It has been shown that poor communication about end of life could result in poor quality of life. In order to better understand what our wishes is, it is important to identify the differences between our workbook, five wish, uh, our wishes, five wishes, and start the talk. Start the talk is a website that has a broad range of resources for cancer patients, healthcare providers, educators, and family members. Whereas our wishes, which is the workbook that we're trying to build, um, will help the patient and close family members to plan and communicate together about their particular wishes regarding their loved one's end of life. Five Wishes is really an individual tool where the patient makes all the decisions regarding their end of life and it doesn't ask questions like, is there an activity that you would like to do with your family before death? It also doesn't open the door for the family to communicate together about death and this is a topic that would be addressed in our wishes. And so again, our wishes is really a family-based workbook that will facilitate communication between the patient and close family members. This tool will be built with families and healthcare providers. It will be made compatible with all age groups. For example, there will be suggestions in each section on how the activity can be modified based on the child's age. It will help everyone in the family express their wishes on what they would like to do or not do before their loved one, before their loved one's death. It can be very challenging to talk as a family about end of life. And this is also a difficult subject for some healthcare workers to address, which is why Five Wishes was created. So expanding on the framework of Five Wishes, we want to develop our wishes to be able to include the immediate family in the end of life planning process, because to this date, there's no family based workbook that aims to simultaneously improve the quality of life and bereavement process of patients and their close family members. So um, now here 
becomes irrational of a research proposal where we have a patient or we have a person called Willem who has a tumor which has metastasized and he's wondering about uh, the availability of a family-based resource that would actually help him and his family. So we, he's, we he's trying to find a tool that would target his mental and, psycho, and psychosocial health as well as his family members too. So now we uh, now come to our wishes, which is a workbook um, that is useful in such situations since the family based, it will act, it's a family based communication tool, which will facilitate and mediate communication between Willem and his family members. And before, um, before um, in order to improve his quality of life and end of life, if he actually, it actually comes that he dies. And you can have sections in the book uh, where he can express, for example, what he thinks about dying or express his wishes before or after dying. So in fact, we are trying to address the gap uh, of a family communication tool, uh, like our wishes in advanced care planning and end of life planning. So this brings us to the aims and the hypothesis of this workbook. And the first aim is to determine if our wishes helps improve quality of life and decrease distress in family members when a close relative is about to die. And the second aim is to determine if the tool impacts positively the grieving process of, of the family members after the, uh, the person has died. So we hypothesize that this tool could help decrease quality of life uh, increase actually quality of life in family members by decreasing the psychiatric distress after the death of their loved one. And this is based on research which has shown that even partially completing an advanced care planning tool improves the quality of life among patients with cancer and their caregivers. Okay, so now getting into the methodology. So we are planning to conduct a randomized control trial with two phases. So as Justine mentioned, we will first, in our first phase, create the Our Wishes workbook, which um, will be with the help of healthcare providers and family members of people who have terminal cancer. And then we will use workshops and focus groups to create the uh, workbook. And then our second phase will be the randomized control trial, where we aim to recruit 60 participants with different kinds of cancer from the Siegel Cancer Center in Montreal. They will be randomly assigned to end either the intervention group, so having uh, the chance to get the workbook, uh, our wishes, or standard care practice, which is our control group here. We will have a baseline assessment of distress and quality of life of the families and the patient. Yeah, the patient. And then a follow-up assessment at six months and 12, 12 months to assess grief, distress, and quality of life once the person has died. And then, uh, so for our hypothesized result, following our first aim, aim we uh, hypothesize that distress will be significantly reduced at six and 12 month follow-ups after using the R wishes compared to the control group who is using standard care. Also, quality of life will be significantly increased for family members who use the workbook compared to standard care, again, at six and 12 month follow-ups. And finally, in line with our second aim, we hypothesize that the grieving process for families will be significantly improved with the Our Wishes uh, workbook compared to the control group. But yeah, ultimately our goal is to improve outcomes for families like Willem, and that's why um, that's exactly what our wish aims to do. Thank you so much for your time and uh, listening. We're open to any questions. Thank you very much. We will now open the floor to the judges. Thank you. Uh, excellent presentation, guys. I think this is, uh, I want to commend you for taking on a, a very difficult um, topic and something we struggle with a lot in clinic um, on a regular basis. So this is, this is certainly valuable work. Um, usually randomized trials, um, you know, to be considered ethical should, um, you know, be used in situations where we're not really sure what the best uh, way forward is between two options. In a setting like this, where one group is getting more resources and more support, 
Um, do you, first of all, do you think this is ethical? And second of all, second of all, how would you incentivize people to join the trial or, or, um, uh, motivate or, uh, address those who have concerns about being in the standard group? Uh, I can answer that. That's a very good question because for sure it is something that we have to consider. Um, so we're not sure that having our wishes will help. That's what we think. But we also have other resources, like you seen mentioned, the five wishes, the websites for patients. So we can recommend that in the standard care. And um, so, of course, we will try to recruit participants based on helping them and seeing that they could, like either way, they'll have support, but they'll have a workbook in extra in the intervention. I don't know if anyone wanted to add something to that. Um, I wanted to add something to that. In terms of it being ethical, um, I do believe that it would be ethical um, just because in the standard care, they are getting uh, help. It's, it's, if the standard care would be no help at all, um, sort of you have to figure it out on your own, then I believe it would be unethical, but because the patients would be referred to other types of resources, um, I believe that that in, in this particular case, it would be ethical to to um, separate the, the the groups into two. Well answered. Thank you. Um, I think there's another question in the chat from from Adriana. I'm trying to inform, try to know if five wishes is distinct from our wishes. It's actually different because, as we mentioned, five wishes targets principally um, the patient, while uh, our wishes is trying to incorporate not only even family members, but also healthcare workers, providers. So we're trying to mediate communication between both of them <clears throat> and trying to uh, let them express um, their wishes and uh, their feelings about this difficult situation uh, during the palliative care of their patient. So yeah, it's actually different because it's it's a um, it's a more family based tool rather than an individual tool just for patients. Yes, and if I can just add one thing, so it's also that um, the family workbook will be able to take into consideration the family's wishes as well as the patient's wishes. So it's really communicating throughout the family and with healthcare providers, which Five Wishes doesn't do. So, so Adriana kind of asked my question this time, but anyway, um, where exactly are you at? It says, it says in your um, letter of intent, we are building and testing. How far along are you at actually building this? Um, so it, 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 does, it does say that, um, but I would say it's in the very, very early stages. Um, it was thanks to this um, opportunity that we gathered together and said, well, what can we do to be able to help cancer patients? What, what is needed within um, the, the psycho-oncology world, which is, which is the lab that um, um, Leonis and Sabrina and I are, are involved in at St. Justin Hospital. And, and so we, we were really at the early stages in terms of um, trying to gather information of how we can start developing our wishes in a way that it's very um, respectful of the families, respectful of the patients. Um, and so there, they, we have talked with different people within the lab and they've given us ideas and things to consider, but it really is at that initial stage right now. That's great, thank you. Uh, let's see, hi there, it's Adriana. Um, I just wanted to congratulate you for putting together a very nice uh, proposal that addresses a different aspect of uh, care for patients with brain tumors, not just metastatic tumors, but really all kinds. I, I had the impression that this overall, this whole symposium has been a real bench to bedside kind of forum. So thank you for providing your perspective on this. Uh, I was just curious what your backgrounds are. 
Uh, yeah, well, I can start. I'm in um, honor psychology at McGill, so doing my undergrads there. But yeah, planning on applying to the PhD. So we're working uh, in a lab doing psychosocial oncology. And I can let the others speak. I'm also a third year psychology student at McGill, and I'm very, very interested in uh, neuropsychology. Um, so yes, that, that would be my background. <laughs> and I'm also a McGill student, but I'm actually in occupational therapy, um, planning, to get, planning to get into med school uh, next year too. And, and I actually got the opportunity by the Brain Tumor uh, Studentship Award to be part of um, uh, this project and actually working in the CPO lab at uh, Essential Steam. So that's why I'm part of the team. Okay, well, thank you for providing that. Uh, I was just curious what healthcare providers you would be intending to administer your tool to the patients and the families? Um, so we are planning to speak with uh, like everyone who's included in the psychosocial oncology. So we have like social workers, uh, psychologists, of course, uh, then medical doctors, then nurses as well. And really like everyone who would be included in the treatment just to have their point of view and to see uh, how they can improve our workbook. Uh, but who, who would be specifically trained to ad administer the, it, so the workbook is really a self-directed thing that patients and families work through? Yes, exactly. So because, we were, um, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, yes, I was going to say, so um, we would have like the psychologist helping with the, the case to explain the workbook, but it's pretty like self-leaded, so yeah. And also I would, I would like to add to that. Um, I think it really depends on the hospital or treatment center, because I know that there are some places that um, have uh, uh, nurses that are trained in, in palliative care. There are some places that don't. And so the, the way that we're hoping to develop our wishes is so that the patients and families are able to do so on their own. And of course, if there is a person available within the team treating the patient or within um, the hospital or treatment center, like a, like a psychologist, like Sabrina said, or a nurse, um, then, then we, would, we would sort of provide instructions for them um, on, on how to answer any questions or how they could implement it. Um, but I don't think it, it necessarily would require um, training to be able to do so because it's our, it, it will be built already um, with psychologists, with nurses, with, ev with everybody that's usually involved in the team. And so we're hoping that by building it together, it will make sense for everybody. Oh, well, thank you for clarifying that, because I had the impression that your target population would be those who are already receiving palliative care, and palliative care can be delivered in such a diversity of settings. Palliative care can be delivered in the home or in a hospice or in the hospital, and so you may have different individuals in all of those settings, and so I wonder in a randomized control trial setting how you would control for something like that. But if it is a largely sort of self-initiated sort of thing that patients and families are just guided through, um, I, th I think that that makes sense. Anyway, thank you for clarifying that for me. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation and uh, the judges for your um, questions. Uh, judges, the conference line is now open. If you would like to um, excuse yourselves from uh, this call to uh, deliberate uh, and then join us back um, on the Zoom call uh, with your results once those have been uh, decided. So thank you so much.